Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. We've got a great presentation lined up for you today, but before we get started, there are just a few general admin points to cover. First and foremost, please use the online question tool to post any questions that you have and we will share them with our speakers. Second, if you experience any technical difficulties today, please let us know using that same questions tool and a member of our admin team will be on hand to support you. And finally, just to note, this session is being recorded and we'll be sharing a copy of that recording with you via email in the coming days. So without further ado, I would like to hand over to our speakers to get us started. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Samir Shah and I'm a partner in Khetan's corporate m &A practice group and I will be your moderator for today. Welcome to our webinar. Our topic for today is how to navigate India's changing patent landscape. Thank you for taking the time to be with us. We are very grateful for the interest and support which our clients, associates and guests have shown in this webinar, which we are running in collaboration with Lexology. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. On this slide is the agenda for today's webinar. In short, the format will be a presentation by two senior members of our intellectual property practice, followed by a Q&A session with audience questions. As Lucy mentioned, please submit your questions using the facility provided in the webinar portal. If, however, we cannot cover all the questions during the webinar, we will respond offline by email after the webinar. The recording as well. In this webinar, we will discuss some very important changes and recent developments in India's evolving patent regime. In summary, the objective of these patent system changes is to achieve quicker, more efficient and more cost effective resolution of IP disputes, whether with statutory authorities or with third parties. These changes are motivated by India's continuing efforts to improve the ease and efficiency of doing business in India and also the exponential growth in recent times of India's emerging companies ecosystem across all forms of tech, including health tech, insure tech, fintech, and edtech. There has also been the continuous growth in foreign investment and the government's aim to continue to attract even more foreign investment. These factors have caused an increasing focus on the economic impact of having an efficient and effective patent system in India. And all the changes we will be speaking about today are steps taken to improve India's patent system in this context. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. To introduce our speakers today, we have two members of our firm's 60 plus member strong national intellectual property team, namely Adhish Nargolkar and Nikhil Ranjan. Our first speaker is Adhish Nargolkar and he is a partner in the firm and the national leader of our intellectual property practice. He is an engineer and a lawyer by training and has over two decades of experience in intellectual property work, including prosecution and enforcement and advisory and contentious matters. He has a very special interest in patents and has expertise and experience in patent work across various sectors, including automobiles, software, and life sciences. Our second speaker is Nikhil Ranjan, who is also dual qualified in engineering and law and brings with him considerable expertise and experience in patents with a particular focus on automotive and mechanical patents. So without further ado, I turn this over to our experts, Adhish and Nikhil, to deliver their presentation. Thank you, Samir. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. The Intellectual Property Appellate Board was established under the Trademarks Act for speedy disposal of appeals and rectification applications, which were earlier lying before the High Courts. Initially, IPAP was devoted to trademarks and geographical indications. However, post the amendments in the Patents Act in 2002, which eventually got enforced in 2007, its jurisdiction was extended to patents and in 2017 to copyrights. When the jurisdiction was extended under the Patents Act, the requirement for the technical member was that he has for at least five years 
held the post of the controller of patents or that he functioned as a registered patent agent for a period of 10 years possessing a technical degree. The IPAB was constituted as an appellate body for all appeals against decisions from the IP offices. As a quasi-judicial body, the IPAB was intended to be a specialist tribunal dealing with intellectual property laws with a technical member as well as a judicial member on the board. The IPAB had its headquarters in Chennai with circuit benches at Mumbai, Delhi, Kolkata, and Ahmedabad only for trademarks. Although the IPAB in its tenure of about 20 years was instrumental in finally disposing of matters, remitting back matters to the IP offices for fresh adjudication, there were administrative issues with the IPAB. Shortage of staff, delays in the appointment of members, because of which there was a pause in functioning of the IPAB affecting its performance. Delays due to the circuit benches not sitting for months in the same city. Because of all these reasons, there were numerous delays in dealing with matters before the IPAB. Consequently, in April 2021, to address all these issues, as well as to reduce the expenditure on infrastructure and operational expenses, the IPAB, along with other tribunals, was abolished by the Tribunal Reforms Ordinance of 2021. Next slide, please. With the abolition of IPAB, all pending matters with the IPAB were transferred to the commercial divisions of the high courts at New Delhi, Mumbai, Chennai, and Calcutta, and in Ahmedabad for Tishman. All revocation petitions and appeals from the IP offices that were to be previously instituted with the IPAB are now to be filed at the high courts. Transfers to these high courts would be as per the situs of the IP or the patent filings. Similarly, for fresh appeals and revocations, the high courts would be as per the status of the IP office. That is, matters transferred from the IP office at, say, Mumbai would be filed at the Bombay High Court. Similarly, appeals from the IP office at, say, Mumbai would be filed at the Bombay High Court. With matters transferred to the High Courts, all fresh revocation petitions and appeals to be filed with these High Courts, this will lead to increasing pressure on the High Courts. The real question was, and still is, whether and how the courts will handle the backlog of cases that are knocking at their doors, especially considering that they're already overburdened with a lot of cases. With this in mind, the Delhi High Court created an Intellectual Property Rights Division, that is the IPD, to deal exclusively with intellectual property cases. The Delhi High Court has also come up with the Delhi High Court Intellectual Property Rights Division Rules of 2022, as well as the High Court of Delhi Rules governing patent suits to fast track decisions in intellectual property matters and especially patent matters, which will be dealt by my colleague Nikhil in the next few slides. Next slide, please. Thank you, Adish. Hello, everyone. I will be discussing on jurisdiction of high courts uh, together with IPD rules and rules governing patent suits. As Adish, uh, as Adish mentioned, due to abolition of IPAB, high courts have now been vested with additional jurisdiction in relation to IP matters. Now, as per the provisions of the Patents Act, suit for infringement of patent, groundless threat, and declaratory suits are supposed to be filed before the district court. In such cases, in case a counter, a counter claim for revocation is filed by the defendant, such suits are transferred to high court. However, high courts at Delhi, Kolkata, Mumbai, and Chennai have original jurisdiction, and such suits may be directly filed before the respective high court. So, position for uh, the originally filed suits is unchanged. As far as revocation of patents are concerned, petitions for same will have 
uh, will now have to be filed before the respective high courts. In relation to appeals arising out of orders from the patent office, these will now lie before the respective high courts. Orders from the patent office uh, will include refusal order in respect of patent applications or any order passed in, uh, in respect of a pre-grant opposition or a post-grant opposition. Then orders passed in respect of divisional applications in, uh, and patent of addition and orders passed in respect of uh, a request filed for amendment of documents including a specification uh, orders passed in respect of restoration of patents and all kinds of orders passed, passed in respect of compulsory licensing so all these are appealable orders and all these uh, appeals will lie before the respective high courts there may be instances that there may be some non-appealable orders which can be brought to the high courts by way of writ petition. Such non-appealable orders may include an order in relation to abandonment of an application or an order in relation to refusal by the patent office to entertain a request made by the applicant. In addition to these, earlier orders passed by the erstwhile IPAB can be challenged before the high court by way of writ petition or by a uh, SLP, that is special leave petition before the Supreme Court. So as a result of these changes, we can see that high courts will now be burdened with appeals and revocation of and revocation petitions. Very recently, around 450 odd patent matters were transferred to Delhi High Court from the IPAB, which are essentially in the form of appeals and revocation petitions. Considering that patent filings have increased over years and patent office has also recruited additional examiners, we can expect a considerable increase in number of appealable orders by the, passed by the patent office. As a result of these, the high courts will definitely have to look into various means by which such appeals may be disposed of in expeditious manner. Next slide, please. As Adish mentioned, to expedite the disposal of IP matters and more particularly the patent matters, the Delhi High Court has notified IPD rules and rules governing patent suits. Here we will see some salient features of the IPD rules, such as hot tubbing, confidentiality club, mediation, and early neutral evaluation. While these rules mention uh, about these salient features, it does not lay down any guidance in relation to sale. I would like to mention here that these are known practices and IPD rules have tried to consolidate the same at one place. Now, as far as hot tubbing is concerned, experts from plaintiff as well as defendant provide their opinion. Such opinions are exchanged among the experts and thereafter the experts meet to draft a joint report summarizing all areas of agreement and disagreement among the experts. Such kind of joint report, uh, when given to the court, it will help in narrowing down the issue in dispute, which will essentially help the court to dispose the matter in expeditious way. Confidentiality club uh, can be formed by the court at any stage of a proceeding. The primary aim of a confidentiality club is to provide a platform to the parties for preservation and exchange of confidential information. So it is generally composed of uh, lawyers and representatives nominated by the parties. The members of the club are desist from disclosing, sharing and utilizing the shared information. So such confidentiality club can be of more use, particularly in relation to process patents, where defendants are generally reluctant to provide process details, citing trade secrets as an issue. In case of mediation, in case the court is of the opinion that parties ought to explore mediation, court may appoint a mediator without the consent of the parties. So, 
here it is very important to note that consent of the parties are not required to appoint a mediator by the court so purpose of the mediation is to find most acceptable solution for the parties so while outcome of such mediation is not binding in nature but it may definitely be looked into to save time and cost in case of early neutral with evaluation it is a process that may take place soon after a case has been filed in court and the case is referred to an expert who is asked to provide a balanced and unbiased evaluation of the dispute so this is different from mediation the parties either submit written uh, written comments or meet in person with the expert then the expert identifies each side strength and weakness and provides an evaluation of the likely outcome of a trial now such evaluation can assist the parties in assessing their case and may definitely propel them towards a settlement if if needed now however there may be instances where parties may not want to expo, uh, want an expert to identify its weakness and strength and therefore would not like to have an early neutral evaluation so to avoid such a situation in our experience it is always beneficial to assess and evaluate the matter before approaching any court well why all these features have been included in the rules with an aim for expeditious adjudication of disputes we are yet to see the scenarios in which these will be used by the court and how frequently they are used by the courts next slide please Delhi rules governing uh, patent suits mentions and define various briefs which are required to be filed by the parties except for claim construction brief till now all other briefs have been part of a plaint or a, or a written statement in some or the other form however they were neither a part of any particular rule nor have been identified by case laws in india thus these rules have primarily tried to bring consistency in plaints and written statements by defining the briefs and making them mandatory on part of the parties now as far as uh, claim construction is concerned it is a process in which the courts interpret the meaning and scope of a patent's claim the rules uh, simply mention that the plaintiff as well as uh, the defendant should provide construction of each term used in a patent claim now in the absence of any uh, particular guidelines in the rules it becomes vague as to how the claim should be construed and what principles should be applied to construe the claims thus it becomes very important for the parties to strategize the construction of claim in our view it is uh, it would be best for the parties to apply established principle of construction of claims such principles can be one the patent specification should be given a purposive construction secondly the words used in the claim should be given meaning with which a normal person skilled in the art would give thirdly terms terms in the claim which are unclear may be defined by reference to the body of the specification in addition to these prosecution history of a patent should be looked into one may also consider looking into prosecution of corresponding applications filed in foreign jurisdictions here i would like to reemphasize that all care should be taken while construing the claims because one may not get any opportunity in future to modify the construction given to the claims as far as infringement brief is concerned it should be filed by the plaintiff and should provide a mapping or comparison of claims vis-a-vis -vis defendant's product or process mapping should be done for each and every limitation defined in the claim as uh, and as such uh, the limitations may be a constructional limitation or a process limitation in respect of uh, uh, process steps at times it becomes difficult for the plaintiff to ascertain the 
process the steps of the defendant and thus in such cases it can be pleaded before the court to direct the defendant to disclose the process steps uh, prior to the filing of infringement brief damages or profit briefs should be provided should provide reasonable estimate of the extent of damages or accounts of profit now since it may be difficult for the plaintiff to ascertain the damages or account of profit at, at initial stage of a suit the rules allow the plaintiff to amend the estimates at a later stage of proceeding as such depending upon the disclosure from the defendant estimates may be amended by the plaintiff at a later stage of a proceeding similar to infringement brief non infringement brief should be filed by the defendant and should provide a mapping or comparison of claims vis-a-vis -vis the product or process now coming to invalidity brief uh, same should be filed by a party challenging a patent before the court uh, the rules require the party to identify and list all prior arts and prior use relied upon by the party while identifying such prior arts and prior use necessary bibliographic details or data which can help to locate such prior arts and prior use publication should be given in addition to these a conclusive analysis of the prior art vis-a-vis -vis the claim should be provided further if invalidity is pleaded on any of the grounds contained in section 3 of the patents act which uh, essentially deals with non patentable invention an explanation and reasoning for the same should be provided in the brief rather than only relying on that particular ground also if the patent is attacked on ground of enablement the brief should clearly point out the claims that have been sufficiently disclosed in uh, so, uh, that have not been sufficiently disclosed in supported by or enabled in the specification with an explanation of the sufficiency of uh, for each of the claims in our opinions uh, these briefs uh, will definitely bring con uh, consistency in pleadings and will also help the parties to understand the position of each other now apart from the brief uh, the rules also put an onus on the plaintiff to file a document furnishing details and updated status of all corresponding patent applications filed in other jurisdiction this requirement is very similar to the requirement under the patents act wherein the plaintiff is under obligation to furnish uh, such details before the patent office considering these in our view the applicant should keep a close watch on the prosecution of applications uh, in foreign jurisdiction and should try to keep the claims as consistent as possible with each other because the court may look into the prosecution details of the application at any stage of the proceeding next slide please here we will see some key features of the delhi uh, rules governing patent suits as discussed in the previous slide the rules have categorically indicated to provide mapping of claims vis-a-vis -vis defendant product or process claim mapping ideally should be in the form of a table wherein one column can deal with claim limitation and second column can deal with elements or process step of the defendant's product or process so in our experience the claim mapping should not merely list the elements of the claims vis-a-vis -vis the elements of defendant's product or process but should also provide a statement or a reasoning for the same such uh, things uh, become essential when uh, uh, one is attempting to establish infringement by way of doctrine of equivalence the rules stipulates uh, four conditions under which summary adjudication may be considered by the court first is where the remaining term of the patent is 5 years or less secondly a certificate of validity in respect of the patent has been issued or upheld by erstwhile ipab or by high court or by supreme court third condition is if the defendant is a repeated infringer or of the same or related patent and the fourth condition is if the defendant has admitted the validity of patent but has denied in infringement of the patent further for assisting the judges the rules provide a provision under which the court may draw 
a, a panel of advisors who may be experts in the field of science, economics, or law. These advisors may also be academicians, accountancy experts, patent agents, and officers from the IP office. In our view, such panel of advisors will uh, not only assist the judges, but may also be helpful for the parties, especially in cases where monetary damages are claimed. Further, to achieve timely and qualitative resolution of a dispute, the rules prescribe case management hearings. Prior to the first case management hearing, the court on the first hearing will look into the case and, it is, and, and if it is satisfied that there is a prima facie infringement, the court can order an interim injunction or can appoint local commissioner. Post the first hearing, the court conducts first case management hearing in which it looks into briefs filed by the parties and decides on the court, decides on the actual issues. So this way, uh, all the three case, case management hearing takes place. And in the third case management hearing, they, uh, they primarily look into the issues and direct the parties to proceed with the trial. With this, uh, now I'll hand over to Adish, who will talk about a SCP matter when the Delhi High Court has passed an anti-enforcement injunction. Over to you, Adish. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. The Delhi High Court passed India's first anti-enforcement injunction order in the case of Inter-Digital Technology Corporation versus Xiaomi Corporation in October of 2020. Before we get into the judgment, uh, let's see what is an anti-enforcement injunction order. It is an order restraining a party from enforcing an anti-suit injunction. An anti-suit injunction is an injunctive relief granted by a court having territorial jurisdiction over a party, restraining it from instituting or prosecuting a case in a foreign court. An anti-suit injunction is granted in situations where the continuation of the proceedings before the foreign court will result in grave injustice to either of the parties or defeats the end of justice. Coming to the facts of the present case, the plaintiff had filed a patent infringement suit against the defendants in relation to certain SEPs, that is standard essential patents for manufacturing mobile handsets, which were compliant with 3G and 4G standards. Prior to the institution of this suit before the Delhi High Court, Xiaomi had already filed an action before the Wuhan Court in China, seeking fixation of global franc royalty rates in respect of all the SEPs which were held by the plaintiffs, which included the SEPs in India. The defendants later also filed an anti-suit injunction application before the Wuhan Court seeking that the plaintiffs be restrained from prosecuting the infringement suit before the Delhi High Court, and eventually was successful in getting an ex parte anti-injunction suit from the Wuhan Court. On becoming aware of the order that was passed by the Wuhan Court, the plaintiffs filed an interlocutory application before the Delhi High Court, seeking that the order be restrained and Zami should not be enforcing the Wuhan court's anti-suit order. After reviewing the jurisprudence on the point, the court granted an anti-enforcement injunction against the defendants from enforcing the anti-suit injunction order, which they had obtained from the Wuhan court, stating that the issues before both the courts were different. While the Wuhan court was adjudicating upon the friend licensing terms, it was not considering the question of infringement at all. On the other hand, the Delhi High Court was adjudicating upon the question of infringement of specific Indian patents. The court further stated that the issue of infringement of the plaintiff's Indian patents could be adjudicated and adjudicated only by an Indian court and that the Wuhan court had no jurisdiction to adjudicate on this issue. With this order, it has opened up the doors and has also laid down guidance for adjudication of anti-enforcement actions in the future by Indian courts, which are not only relevant 
for patent infringement related proceedings, but also for multi jurisdictional disputes which arise in cross border transactions. Any party who is interested in obtaining an anti suit injunction would need to think twice on the enforceability of such an order in different jurisdictional courts. An anti suit injunction from a foreign court against proceedings in India may not be now an effective relief in all situations and especially in matters relating to patents. The courts in India could prevent like what they have done just now prevent enforcement of such an order by way of an anti enforcement injunctive order. Parties may need to think and rethink their strategy of seeking a declaration of global fran rates from a single jurisdictional court. We may now see parties finding suits for declaration of rent rates only in respect of patents granted in the concerned jurisdiction where the action is initiated rather than on a global basis. Needless to mention, the FRAN terms declared by a court in one jurisdiction will need to be taken into consideration as a persuasive value in other jurisdictions as well. However, they will not be binding. Although the plan terms in other jurisdictions may depend on the patent portfolio in that particular jurisdiction, as well as the scope of the inventions covered thereunder. At the same time, parties in India will also need to strategize better, since the chances of enforcement of an anti suit injunction granted by Indian court can be blocked by foreign courts by way of an anti enforcement injunction, which can't be ruled out. Next slide, please. The key takeaways in this presentation are firstly, the appeals against controllers, orders, and revocation need to be thought through. On receiving an order from the patent office, one needs to think of whether he should prefer an appeal to the High Court having the jurisdiction to entertain the appeal considering the pendency of the number of cases before that particular high court or file a review with the patent office and take your chances. The IPD rules and the patent rules, which my colleague Nikhil mentioned, are a welcome move to streamline the practice and procedure to expedite the disposal of IP cases. Creation of IPD is in line with the global best practices of the IP courts. Patentees should consider to be more active in enforcing their patent rights. Considering these rules, there is a high probability of damages being granted in patent suits in the longer run. After seeing that the Delhi High Court has three specialized IP judges to exclusively take care of IP cases, other High Courts should gear up with these changes and the scenario of patent or IP enforcement should definitely with regard to anti suits and anti enforcement actions, going forward, one needs to be mindful in approaching foreign courts for an anti suit injunction, particularly in patent matters. As I have mentioned before, an anti suit injunction from a foreign court against proceedings in India may not be an effective relief to Indian patents, with the risk of courts in India preventing the enforcement by way of an anti enforcement injunctive order. Thank you very much. Uh, hope that you have enjoyed the presentation. Over to you, Samir. Thank you very much, Shadish and Nikhil. That was simply outstanding. And now we should take some questions. I can see the Q&A chat box is teeming with questions. Um, let me give both of you a minute to just grab your breath. And in the meantime, let me rummage through these questions. Let's see what we have. All right. So maybe Nikhil, why don't we start with you? And and I heard the word Delhi a lot, and probably that's where this question is coming from. Uh, and I'll read. For the time being, does this mean that because of these changes, the Delhi High Court is a preferred jurisdiction? <laughs> uh, if there is an option, uh, certainly yes. Delhi High Court uh, should be a preferred option. Uh, but however, it all depends uh, upon the origin of the IP matter. 
which is uh, if the matter is uh, filed in say mumbai ip office uh, uh, patent office mumbai appeals uh, cannot lie before the delhi ai court so uh, as far as fresh suits are concerned yes with a current ip assignment uh, delhi uh, delhi will definitely be a preferred location uh, if you are able to satisfy the jurisdictional criteria but for the appeals but for the appeal and uh, revocation matters you have to look into the situs and uh, if the application if the patent application has already been filed uh, before the patent office chennai or patent office uh, kolkata or mumbai you can't come to uh, delhi high court for those matters so yes uh, for fresh suits uh, uh, delhi uh, delhi high court will be a preferred location okay understood so adish maybe we come to you and there's a specific question for you from the audience and i'll read hi adish in case of a patent design trademark rejection which is the authority to whom you have to appeal i mean the question is written differently but i think that's what they're trying to say so uh, as i understand the question uh, there is an appeal that needs to be filed from a patent uh, uh, refusal as well as a de a design refusal and a trademark refusal that's right that's that's the question so, yeah so we will need to go to that particular high court for each of these cases and they are different cause of action so therefore there will have to be probably different uh, appeals that need to be filed in those jurisdictions in relation to each of these ips understood maybe i can just carry on with you adish so then nikhil also spoke about this jurisdictional criteria you've also just mentioned it so can you elaborate a little bit who decides which high court has jurisdiction over a particular matter and let's say let's take the example nikhil gave you have the ip office in mumbai that's the one which is passing an order can you appeal to delhi or, or any other high court whatever is the permutation or combination yeah. um, well it all depends on the status because the situs of the ip office will be the relevant factor to decide the high court for example as nikhil mentioned uh, if there is an order uh, from the ip office in mumbai then the appeal needs to lie to the bombay high court uh, there has been one case which is right now pending with the delhi high court uh, which is uh, the thrison group case uh, versus uh, imo holding uh, where uh, this issue is is being considered and uh, it is a pending matter so let's let's see what uh, the delhi high court has to say on this but uh, as of now uh, the citus will decide uh, which high court the appeal needs to go understood there's an interesting question and maybe adish i'll stick with you uh, and, and the question is on writ jurisdiction so they're saying you've spoken about appeals uh, why can't i file a writ Uh, before the high court that has jurisdiction on my registered office so as nikhil mentioned there are certain appealable orders and there are certain orders which cannot be appealed so where there are orders which cannot be appealed then the only possible remedy that one has is to file a writ but in any event the writ will lie in that particular court for example the order of refusal say is in the bombay ip office then the writ will need to be filed with the bombay high court so therefore even if that be the case it will not be in a position for that particular say uh, applicant to go to delhi high court just because delhi high court today has all these rules that are there understood uh, nikhil perhaps we come back to you and again you spoken of some very innovative changes which the delhi high court has introduced in their rules uh, there's a question from the audience what is the likelihood of other high courts following suit and there's another question from the audience which i think i know the answer but the question is do these rules already say apply to other high courts so maybe you can take both these questions do the rules apply to other high courts and what is the likelihood of other high courts following suit so uh, i'll take the second question first that uh, these rules are specific to or uh, delhi high court and they are not binding on any other high court or any other district court in the in the country 
Now, as far as the question concerning that whether other high courts will uh, uh, adopt or will have similar kind of rules or not. So uh, definitely, as we uh, saw in the presentation that uh, now appeals and all appeals and revocation petitions have now been shifted from IPAB to Delhi High Court, uh, to, to the respective high courts. So amount of matters which will be dealt by the high courts have, have tremendously increased because of the uh, transfer of jurisdiction of IPAB to the respective high courts. So the number of cases which will be handled by the high courts in terms of intellectual property and more particularly in terms of patents and all, it will, it, it will definitely increase. And uh, I also mentioned about with the increased number of filings in India, uh, there is uh, there will be increase in number of appealable orders from the high uh, from the patent offices. So considering all these, definitely the all the high courts will have to look into the possible ways and means to expedite the adjudication of disputes in relation to uh, IP matters. And uh, yes, we should uh, uh, others high other high court should look into possibilities of uh, following similar innovation. And uh, we are hopeful that we will see more rules coming from different high courts across the country. Excellent. There's one question suggesting why isn't the government enacting central rules and why is this being left to the high courts? Uh, Nikhil Adish, whoever one, whichever one of you would like to take that question. Well, historically, it has always been that high courts have their rules and therefore uh, it is upon the Delhi High Court or the Bombay High Court to come up with these rules. Now, uh, as Nikhil mentioned, Delhi High Court has been uh, pretty active and that is probably one of the reasons that uh, the judges of the Delhi High Court, I, I do remember Justice Pratibha Singh uh, was one of the judges who was uh, instrumental in having these rules uh, come in. So we need to have certain judges uh, who love IP uh, and they have been instrumental in coming up with these rules. As Nikhil mentioned, we are hopeful that other courts uh, take, take this as an incentive and come up with certain rules for other high courts. Understood. Uh, maybe Nikhil, for you, um, there's a question on technical issues, and uh, I think IPAB had a technical member. The question is, high courts won't necessarily have technical members. Then how would they be able to decide on technical matters that arrive in, say, infringement or claim construction or or what have you? Yeah. So uh, yes, I do agree that IPAB had a technical member uh, in respect of a patent uh, dis, uh, patent uh, uh, case so uh, now technical we should bear in mind that I, uh, ipab also had only one technical member who was generally uh, an expert or a qualified uh, uh, technical member for one particular scientific uh, background now as far as high court is concerned i can see that uh, uh, High courts have more uh, more uh, advisors, more experts uh, who can be appointed by the courts, uh, whether it terms be uh, patent agents or scientific experts, academicians, legal expert. So uh, definitely, uh, high courts uh, uh, will be assisted by lot many other people as compared to IPAB, where IPAB was. Or had only one technical member. At any point of time, High Court can uh, definitely uh, bring the experts from the panel of advisors they have. And in addition to these, uh, we also uh, discussed about hot tubbing, where the court, where the experts from both the parties. When I say experts, those are uh, generally technical experts uh, who have relevant uh, technical background and they look into the matters and they come up with their opinion. So such kind of opinion will also assist the court in framing the issues. So uh, I don't see any reason uh, as to uh, 
uh, high court uh, for the high courts uh, to face any problem in uh, adjudicating uh, patent matters. Understood. And just to add to what Nikhil mentioned, in our personal experiences, because uh, both of us have litigated across uh, jurisdictions in Delhi and other jurisdictions, and uh, we, through our personal experiences, feel that uh, judges, along with uh, the expert affidavits, they are in a position to understand technology and therefore uh, deal with the technical subject. So we don't see that as an issue. Understood. So I, I guess parties should be comfortable that their their issues will be heard and addressed suitably. Now I guess there's another there's another element of case management which is costs, and there's a very apt question. I think maybe Adish, you should take this one. And I'll just read the question: How will the cost of dealing with IP matters before the courts be different from dealing with these matters before the IP office and the IPAB? So before the IPAB, patent agents could appear. However, uh, patent agents alone would not be in a position to appear before the high courts. So they therefore would need advocates or counsels to plead the case before the high court. And generally, before the high court, uh, there is face value and clients do prefer counsels. And counsels cost then uh, may increase and that's probably one of the reasons why the cost of dealing matters uh, before the courts might be on the higher side than the IPAB. Understood. So if we just continue with that sort of chain of thought, we are saying that there will be technical expertise available either in the court or in advisors and panels. Uh, there will be sufficient experience available and hopefully other high courts will frame rules. Uh, so far as costs are concerned, clearly from what I'm hearing from you, Adish, costs will be a little bit more exasperating than, than they were before the IPAB. So Nikhil, if you, I think you mentioned that there should be an infrastructural crunch, but what's your sense? Uh, there are about 3000 cases that have been transferred from the IPAB. Uh, do you perceive with in your experience and with your expertise that the high courts will be able to upskill themselves for the 3000 transferred cases as well as for future cases? Or do you think that's going to be a challenge? And will the challenge be short term or long term? So, uh, see, these 3,000 cases which have been transferred to uh, uh, high courts, it's uh, it's okay. I mean, uh, that is, these 3,000 have been uh, transferred as of now. But going forward, definitely, high courts will uh, experience more appeals, more uh, revocation petitions arising from the patent office, arising from the patents. So, uh, number of cases definitely will go on increasing. So definitely, uh, barring Delhi High Court, which has a specific IP division, which deals, which uh, which is dealing with IP matters, and uh, they have uh, uh, rules governing the patent suits as well as other IP matters. So barring the Delhi High Court, other courts uh, don't have any uh, specific IP division. So with the current uh, uh, its infrastructure, it may be a challenge. Going forward, it may be a challenge for the court to dispose the matters in expeditious way. Definitely, the matters will be uh, dealt with and uh, will be heard by the court. But uh, as we all know that uh, IP matters and more particularly patent matters have an essence uh, of time and we should look into the matters. Uh, uh, the court should look into the matters and dispose of the matters uh, as fast as possible. So uh, yes, definitely uh, other high courts will face uh, different kind of uh, challenges, which the time will tell as to uh, how to deal. And uh, as we mentioned earlier also, and as we discussed uh, that uh, other high courts uh, should definitely look into framing uh, rules specific to IP uh, uh, intellectual property matters and should have a, a division that is IP division uh so that uh, these matters can be expeditiously adju uh, adjudicated great i can see a couple of our attendees have their hands raised uh, unfortunately we will not be unmuting any of our attendees i'll request you to submit questions through the q a chat auction there are quite a few uh, but i'll just request all of you to uh, 
keep your hands down so again just conscious of time we will go with a few more questions and nikhil maybe i'll stay with you you mentioned claim mapping and then adish i need to i have there have been at least seven eight questions on anti enforcement in general so I, i'll try and collate them together but nikhil on claim mapping there's a specific question when you mentioned about claim mapping what is it that is to be mapped would you map a plaintiff's product which is in the market with the defendant's product or is it another exercise that you were referring what is expected by the rules so uh, claim mapping should be a comparison between the claims of the patent and uh, the product or process of the defendant so it is advisable not to compare with the compare the plaintiff's product with the defendant's uh, product as the plaintiff's product may not have all the limitations of the independent claim uh, so having uh, having said this at times uh, it may be better for the court's understanding to compare the plaintiff's product and the defendant's product but uh, that should be done only in those situations uh, uh, where the entire claim of the patent maps with the plaintiff's product and the plaintiff is so confident that uh, his product is definitely mapping on the claims and therefore uh, for a better understanding of the court the plaintiff's product can be mapped uh, with the defendant's product but uh, in general the crux is you have you should map the claim versus the defendant product understood understood very clear so um very well just moving to adish and adish and anti enforcement there are quite a few different questions that have been raised i guess the best way to summarize them is please if you can add more from a strategy perspective because the idea behind today's discussion is to give all our listeners and all our attendees a pragmatic way forward how should they a either have a strategy to defend against anti enforcement injunctions or how should they have a strategy of using anti enforcement injunctions to their benefit if you can cover both and please take please take some time on this i know that because there are at least five or six different questions which have melted into one so when you are looking at an anti enforcement injunction now anti uh, anti enforcement injunction is basically an injunction to stop the anti suit injunction that a party has got from some other court so as i mentioned before now an anti suit injunction uh, that has been obtained from a foreign court against the proceedings in india with this judgment uh, it is clear that it is not an effective relief because normally one gets an anti suit injunction to stop the proceedings in a different court but with uh, this judgment there is certainly a risk that the courts in india will prevent that anti suit injunction order by way of an anti enforcement injunctive order so as i mentioned uh, in my presentation uh, the parties will need to think of a different way of seeking declaration of the frand rates from a single jurisdictional court for example if they are litigating in say germany they could they should uh look at the frand rates in that particular country and not the global rates because if you are looking at global rates and there is an action in a different court it it will be difficult because uh, the anti suit injunction that one gets from that particular court may not be enforceable in the present court i hope uh, i have been able to respond to the all the questions that uh, you had samir no no that that's helpful and uh, i am conscious of time but just looking at the sheer number of questions i'm tempted to uh, maybe take a minute or so beyond our discretion so nikhil if you can just come in here on and there's, there's an interesting one let's say uh, you've received rather you've been granted an indian patent and you you're filing an infringement suit but let's say the same patent has unfortunately been rejected uh in a in a foreign jurisdiction what's the impact uh, you should perceive on the infringement suit in india in in these circumstances 
so uh, rejection of a corresponding patent application in a foreign jurisdiction uh, is not uh, it's something it's not binding on the court uh, there is no uh, automatic thing that uh, if the uh, just because my patent has been rejected in the foreign jurisdiction uh, i will not have uh, any relief uh, visa with the indian patent it's not so but yes having said that yes it has persuasive value and uh, the direct impact will be on the kind of uh, interim injunction because it might be difficult to establish a prima facie case uh, if the plaintiff uh, corresponding patent has been rejected in a foreign jurisdiction unless uh, the plaintiff uh, is in a position to prove the reasons for the same say for example i'll give an example uh, uh, almost every jurisdiction has uh, some definition of invention so there are certain inventions which are not patentable in india there are certain inventions which are not patentable in some other jurisdiction so if there is a we call it as a subject matter uh, so if there is a subject matter rejection in any of the jurisdiction then definitely the plaintiff can show to the court that the rejection which was there in the other jurisdiction was because of a b c reasons one of the reason may be a subject subject matter rejection so uh, yes uh, result of all these that ad interim or interim injunction might be difficult to obtain in case of any rejection uh, we receive from the foreign jurisdiction understood i have last two questions and i will leave it for either maybe both of you can just maybe take 30 30 seconds or each so uh, first question is very is connected to what nikhil just explained um and the question is why is it that western jurisdictions and i don't know what western jurisdictions means but western jurisdictions are more stringent when it comes to scrutinizing patent applications than asian jurisdictions and the second question is given how these new changes are being introduced to what extent do you recommend companies and clients consider policy advocacy as an effective tool of partnering in rule framing so uh, samir we these are with your first question uh, with due respect uh, i don't uh, fully agree that the western uh, jurisdictions uh, are stringent uh, when it comes to granting of uh, patents uh, we have seen uh, numerous patents in the western jurisdictions uh, and i don't want to name any of the jurisdictions per se but we have seen uh, patents being granted in different jurisdictions uh, where if that patent was uh, filed in india uh, it probably would not have sailed through uh, so therefore there have been cases where and particularly when it comes to pharmaceutical patents there is a different and there is a difference vis-a-vis the law as nikhil mentioned uh, section 3 which relates to uh, inventions which are not patentable or uh, from a subject matter perspective particularly section 3d hits uh, pharmaceutical companies where uh, they are granted patents in different jurisdictions including the western jurisdiction but india they are not in a position to but when it comes to novelty and inventive step uh, and the criteria for that it is globally the same but uh, we have still seen patents being granted in uh, the western jurisdiction uh, which ought not to have been granted uh, there uh, i don't know whether nikhil wants to add on uh, to what i mentioned no it's uh, uh, i agree with you arish on this i i i fully agree okay um, so excellent your think... second question was on the advocacy uh, that's right can, can you repeat the question uh, since uh, sure it's to do with the fact that rules are rules are being framed on an ongoing basis do you recommend clients implement a good policy advocacy regime uh, to be on the the front line of some of these changes well uh, not just clients it is basically the industry uh, we have seen uh, that uh, the industry needs to be pretty active uh, in uh, having such policies and 
advocating these policies with the government and it is when i say industry it is not just uh, the industry but the industry along with the lawmakers the advocates uh, the industry everyone needs to come together to come up with whatever changes they need in respect of their jurisdiction sorry i know that uh, we have exceeded uh, but uh, that is what i wanted to mention excellent no indeed we have and uh, I, I think our hosts at lexology have been very kind uh, to, to give us this few additional minutes so with that uh, perhaps we just move to the next slide and uh, i would like to extend a very warm vote of thanks to our audience and we hope you found the webinar interesting and a worthwhile investment of your time uh, it certainly was an enjoyable preparation and an enjoyable exercise for us to bring this to you uh, we will separately send a request for your feedback on the webinar please take the time to send us your feedback comments criticism compliments everything is welcome and the form is short it takes no longer than a minute we know your time is precious um, please do not hesitate to contact us regarding any matters that arise from this webinar our contact information is on the slide in front of you i also want to thank our panelists for sharing their experiences and their expertise with us today Adish and Nikhil, thank you very much. Without you, this webinar would not have been possible. You did an outstanding job, I must say. And finally, a special thanks to Lexology for partnering with us on this marquee event. Um, once again, thank you everybody for your attendance today, and we look forward to being of service in future webinars.